Hello, church family. I hope you're well and trust that God is keeping you encouraged and hopeful. I'm speaking to you this week from inside my study at the church office. A few updates for you and then another devotional from Scripture. First of all, you may have heard that I recently said that the Fall Prayer Partnership is going to be moved up and become the Summer Prayer Partnership. The reason for that is fairly obvious. There's just so much going on. We need to be praying. Uh, I know a lot of you are praying, and you're praying in groups and not just by yourself. But this is an effort to coordinate our prayers, to lift many voices on the very same themes. So we'll have sign-up information for that coming out very soon. Secondly, the Contra Costa County Health Department has made changes to their health order. And specifically, it allows our office to get a, a little bit closer to operating like normal. We'll be able to have visitors come and come into the office only one at a time and following certain protocols. But I wanted you to know about that. Uh, next, we have some folks that are moving out of state. Tyler and Jamie Smith leave for Idaho next Monday morning early. And Brian and Millie Smith leave for Texas. They're leaving on June 28. Both Brian and Tyler have accepted jobs out of state. We love you guys. We'll miss you. We wish you Godspeed. And if you know them, wish them well. Good news on the home front. Uh, Garrett and Mary Beth Taylor had their little girl, Bonnie Joy, born on June 2nd. Mom and everyone are doing well. Justin and Julia Davis, likewise, had their little boy, Nolan Joshua, on June 8th. Again, mom and everyone's at home and doing well. Next, I'd like to just briefly talk about our Facebook group page that was started. You might remember when the whole COVID-19 shelter in place began, and it was a way of ministering to one another, talking with one another, sharing testimonies that would encourage one another during this shelter in place. How are you doing? How are you managing? And so forth. Uh, it's gotten a little bit broader. We're getting more and more sort of things put in that group. We like to try and keep it in there a little narrow again, keep it to its focus. Uh, there are other vehicles for prayer requests and it will actually reach more people. So keep that in mind and we'll see if we might change the parameters to this as time goes on. And we'll see what we'll do when, when this whole shelter in place thing is done. So just something to be thinking about. Lastly, on updates, it's about the Lord's Supper. This coming Sunday is the second Sunday of the month. Once again, we'll be sharing in communion. And because we're doing it in this very unique format at this time, we want to remind you, what some of the particular things are to keep in mind. So here's that brief clip of Pastor Scott when he summed up those points recently. Um, I do want to remind you of the four guidelines Tony provided last week that will serve just as a help for us as we move forward getting ready for the Lord's Table this coming Sunday. The first is to remind you that all regular parameters apply to the Lord's Table. The first is that you have faith in Christ, that you are born again, that Christ is your Lord, He is your Savior, and that you know Him and that you've been redeemed by him and bought by him, and, and you have faith in the resurrected Christ. The second, as with all Sundays, if I were up here sharing the Lord's table with you, I'd remind you to, that, to really confess your sin, come humbly before God, have a worshipful heart, a worshipful attitude, knowing that your sins are forgiven. Be transparent with the Lord. Confess your sin and come humbly before him. Thirdly, one of, the, one of the regular parameters is be at peace. Be at peace with fellow believers. Um, typically, during the Lord's table, we fence it in such a way to remind you that if, there's, if you're at odds with a brother or sister, that the scriptures take it seriously. And the scriptures say that to leave your gift at the altar and go be at peace with your brother or sister, if you know that they have something against you, we'd ask that you do that same thing before this Sunday. If you're at odds with someone, pick up the phone, give them a call, and resolve that issue with your brother, with your sister. Next, we'd ask you to prepare the elements ahead of time. Tony shared with you about the bread, the cracker, wafers that you can use as, as the element for the bread. And for the, for the juice, some kind of fruit juice, wine, if, that's in, if your conscience allows, those are fully acceptable. Um, this is just a time to prepare beforehand. Know in advance what we're getting into and set up those elements so that you're not rushing around at the last minute trying to get ready for the Lord's table. Thirdly, really seek to maintain a worshipful atmosphere during the Lord's table. Uh, I know that many of you with small children, that may not be as easy as it sounds. Um, do your best. Shepherd your family through this time. Normally, they might be in the nursery or in Sunday school, and it's just real easy for you to sit quietly before the Lord and get ready 
to meet with the Lord during, during this time. If your children are with you, do your best to, to be with them, to worship with them, and to help them understand what we're doing together as a church. Our hope is that our time around the table really does minister to you. And, and we will only therefore be doing this during our online service. Uh, we will not be attaching the Lord's table to the recorded part of the service. We really think that, again, communion in this way is already, is, is already an extraordinary measure taking it online like we're doing. And we just feel in our hearts and in our conscience that taking it during the recorded, a recorded portion of the service would really be just that much far removed from what we believe is just Lord's intent for the church to do it when it gathers. So we'd ask that, so just so you know, if you look to, look to see the recording later, the Lord's table will not be there. We're going to be taking it only live during the nine o'clock service. Well, last week's pastor cast was a bit of a uh, spirited devotional coming from Psalms 140 to 142, where David there was responding to the traps uh, being set for him by the enemy, and he prays for God's deliverance, and we use that to exhort you to be wise about what you're involving yourself in uh, in this current uh, moment, and make sure you're not falling into the devil's traps. This week is a little bit of a different focus, and it's coming from a different psalm, but another psalm. Nonetheless, Psalm 131. It's a very short psalm, but it's packed with profound and helpful insight about how to find peace and how to maintain your equilibrium when your life is surrounded by noise. Let me read it. It's a Psalm of David, Psalm 131. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O oh Israel, Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Very short psalm, but it speaks to our times in many ways. You know, there's a lot of anguish that, that people are feeling, a lot of anxiety and nervousness that is being felt. And I think this is due in part, not entirely, but due in part to the largeness of the questions that are being raised by the culture and society and the speed at which they're coming at us one after another through media and social media and so forth. And they create a burning desire in the Christian to have an answer, to have answers from, from Scripture, to respond. Uh, COVID-19 is where it began. And, and then the government's response to COVID-19 and what role should government have in things like this? And then the politics surrounding all this. And then came the death of George Floyd that was placed before everyone. And then the ensuing protests and then the riots and, and, the, and the looting and then targeted attacks against police. You know, they, All of these involve cries of real people, suffering of real people, as well as all sorts of sinful and wicked uh, traps being woven into, as we saw last week. But I want you to think about the hurts and the pains here that are involved in these kinds of moments. The scripture does call us to weep with those who weep. The questions raised, what do we do? You know, what, what does scripture say about these problems that underlie all these hurts and all these pains of people? Well, beyond being quick to listen, and slow to speak, which is something you need to do, and some of you need to be reminded about it. And then beyond making sure that you understand the reality of what's going on, and not just rumors or statistics or media spin, uh, beyond all that, and beyond wanting to satisfy a desire to do something so you can feel better about yourself and check that box, which is never the motive that you ha should have beyond all those things and before digging into scripture uh, and finding out what scripture says about each and every issue from every possible angle. Before all that, think of Psalm 131. Consider this. Psalm calls us to pause long enough to make sure that our hearts are quiet in all this. 
because quiet hearts listen better. Psalm 131, I think, provides needed guidance for this uh, anxiousness and that, that is being experienced by so many and the sense of weightiness of the issues and the speed of which they're coming at us all, you know. Uh, it's a psalm of David, and it's not about blissful detachment. It's about how to calm the noise before you respond. You know. Verse 1, let's walk through it. Here are three things David does not do. O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. The heart is that place, mission control center, uh, where our thoughts are formed and our feelings reside and decisions are made, opinions are made. My eyes are not raised too high. Your translations say my uh, are not haughty. The eyes here uh, uh, speak of what David is focused on. His ambitions, they're not proud. He doesn't set them too high. And lastly, I do not occupy myself. I don't occupy my heart, my thoughts, and my time with things too great and too marvelous for me. I think what David is saying here, he's saying, I don't make it my goal to set my mind or my heart or give my time to things that are simply too great for me, that are beyond me. And this is saying a lot because David was king. He had a, lar a lot of large matters that he had to pay attention to daily. But he realizes that there are things that belong to God and then there are things that belong to us, to him. You know, he, he, he is cons contenting himself with his God-assigned place, his God-assigned role. David's come to the place where all of us need to come, where you can say, I've learned something. You are God, and I'm not. He's content with his creatureliness and the, the limitations, his God-given limitations. He understands that there are matters that I am not designed to know. There are problems that I will never solve. There are things that are too high for me. He's not obsessed with answering all the noise. You know, he's content. And that sometimes is a hard place to, to arrive at. I think David may have had, this is speculation, Deuteronomy 29, 29, in his mind, after all, David was a king, and as a king, he was, he was forced to make a handwritten copy of the law. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord, but the revealed things belong to us and to our children. There are things that only God knows, and there are things that God gives us to know, and we're to occupy ourselves with those things. You know, Solving ethnic tensions worldwide or in our country, solving any systemic racism, identifying who or what is really behind all these problems, who is responsible, that is something that you nor I are ever going to resolve. Ensuring that every honest and good police officer is never going to be wrongly characterized as a bigot or, or targeted when he is not, when he or she is good. That's a problem that we are not going to solve, that God doesn't give to you or me. Ensuring, ensuring that politicians will tell the truth always, ha ha, and do what is just and right, put others first. That's a problem you and I are never going to solve and aren't called to solve beloved the trust the the solution for all these type of level problems on this level involves what changing all human hearts simultaneously forever that's never going to happen here except in the kingdom to come when our lord jesus christ returns you know i, I don't want to be misunderstood here uh, I, I want to be careful here. This is not an excuse for avoiding God-given responsibilities or the challenges of life. This is not an excuse to not dream big. You know, yes, we're called to, to, to attempt great things for God and expect great things from God, but there are things that are beyond us. Uh, I praise God that, that, that people 
come together in the church to care for or orphans and widows in their distress and seek to extend mercy and yes and, and justice. But God's justice, defined as he defines it. But solving this level of systemic problems on a global scale it's beyond you and me it's not something we're even to try and own it belongs to god sometimes our efforts are simply rooted in pride and an unwillingness to accept our creatureliness he is god and we are not and we are to concern ourselves with what god has given us directly to do within our callings our vocations and our providential opportunities that he places before us you know you know sometimes the grandkids will come over our, my home or maybe i'm doing something i'm outside recently i was lifting a heavy pick and was working in the garden and one of them says poppy gonna help you i want to help you let me try and i have to say this is too heavy for you this this is beyond you and that's what david's learned there are problems that are too big for us they're beyond us. We're, we're, we're not called to carry that weight that belongs to God. You know? you know, and I've learned in applying this to myself and in using it in, in, in counseling others, some practical steps to take is you draw two circles next to each other and one of them you label God and the other you label me. And you, you, you write your list of, of what are all the sources of the noise in your life right now, all the issues, and then you decide, biblically speaking, which circle are you going to put that in? Solving all of society's ills, what circle are you going to put that in? Loving my neighbor who lost his job, what circle are you going to put that in? Well, that belongs in yours, you know. It's like the old adage of the relationship between the forest and the trees. Some people lose the trees because they're looking at the forest, and others lose the forest because they're looking at the trees. Well, when it comes to societal ills like this, on a level like this, on a global level, and we're talking about permanence, there's only one who sees the entire forest. There's only one who knows all things possible, all things contingent, all things real, all things true. And the only one who knows those things is God. We are to be aware of the forest. Yes, there are large matters, but our hands are only going to be able to touch that tree. And our hearts shouldn't be consumed with the forest, overwhelmed with the noise of these forest-level issues. You'd be more concerned about that individual, that family at God's place right in your path, you know. It's a whole lot of noise trying to solve everything. You have a neighbor, you have a friend, a family member who has experience the pain of racism of bigotry you listen be quick to listen slow to speak weep with those who weep and you pray and ask god to help you understand and you love and you extend mercy you know a, a family or an individual uh, who is a police officer who has experienced being targeted or being characterized by others as a, you know, a, a bad cop, when in reality, they don't have an ounce of racial prejudice in them, and they seek to honor God in what they do. You be quick to listen, slow to speak. You hear them out. You weep with those who weep. But beloved, taking on the whole forest, having answers for everything, knowing what at the base of everything uh, i'm talking about specifically as, as jim mentioned in his recent sermon we can say the sin is the ultimate problem behind everything but to address specific matters in time and space we need to identify who and what well you can identify who and what right there but not the whole forest that belongs to god you know so three things david doesn't do he knows his place and he's content with it. Uh, verse 2. Here's what David does. I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Here's what David's done. He's, he's learned to, to, to bring peace to his own inner turmoil. 
to his own heart. Um, and it's helpful to understand here how strongly he feels about it by virtue of looking at the, uh, at the original Hebrew here. We don't get it here in the translation, uh, but literally what verse, verse 2 says is, uh, if I have not calmed and quieted my soul, and he doesn't finish it. There's an implication there. If I've not done this, then then what? Well, uh, uh, his original he readers would understand exactly what he's getting at. He's saying something along these lines that if I if I don't quiet my soul within me, then then may God discipline me. Then may the curses of the covenant come upon me. In other words, that's how strong David feels about this. What he's saying is it's it's sinful for me to take on what only belongs to God. And not learn to simply trust him and bring a quietness to my soul. Like verse, like Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. That's a powerful idea. So David's pretty serious about this, you know. See, don't be crushed by what belongs only to God. You know? Learn your limitations and be content with them. Much anguish, I think, comes from trying to control things we can't and answer questions that only God could possibly know the answers to, you know. This is the kind of conversation I get in frequently with young pastors, especially today who just face so much, so much going on. The speed of which all the problems come at them. And once in a while, we'll have a conversation, something like this, when we're talking in seminary about, about just dealing with all these issues and, and then going home and having a family and they'll say how do you do it how do you how do you just deal with all this bear with it all day long and then go home and have dinner and be present for your wife and kids usually my my answer takes the shape of something right along the lines of psalm 131 this is something i had to painfully learn as simple as this somewhere along the line God convinced me and forcibly taught me this. I am not Jesus. I'm not Messiah. And I gave up trying to be a long, long time ago. You know, you need to think about your uh, pastors and what they're going through right now. I received uh, uh, by, from several sources this uh, sort of funny little chart and it came along with an exhortation to pray for your pastors. This was about COVID. I don't expect you to read all this. I'll read it for you. But this is what a lot of your pastors are hearing. And not just here, pastors everywhere. First circle, you can't open the church building yet. It's a huge health risk. You are wrong if you do. Next circle, it's all a big hoax, a conspiracy, a media frenzy. Read this article, this link. Don't be afraid. Next circle, my wife, husband, dad. Grandparent, uncle, sister, brother, niece just passed away from COVID-19. That's real. Here are the 25 things you need to do if you want to meet in your building again. Next circle. My family's going to stay home for a while before coming back. Sorry, can't be there. Next circle. Don't ever open the building again. Home is so much better. Last circle. We need to open the church building. I need to be there and see everyone. What are you waiting for? Noise 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 and all that was before the riots and the looting what are we to do i've calmed my spirit within me it's like a wean child you know? it's something that's that's learned and i think we learn how to do it by the imagery that he uses there he says like a weaned child a child who's not weaned is a child who's still being breastfed, fed by his mother. And sometimes you put that child in his mother's arms and, and he's squirmy and restless because he wants food. This is the place of food. But a weaned child lays in his mother's arms or in his mother's laps, not for food, but for the comfort, the security that he or she feels in his mother's arms. David Paulson wrote a great article on this psalm. You could um, look it up. And he said, this composure is learned in relationship. 
And the relationship imagery here is that of a, a weaned child who's calm now. He's no longer restless. He, he's lying in his mother's arms feeling loved and secure. The predominant imagery that we have in the New Testament, given to us primarily by our Lord Jesus, is that of learning to see God as your heavenly Father. And learning that He loves you, that He cares for you, learning and knowing that you do not need to be anxious about tomorrow because your Heavenly Father knows what you need and learning to rest in His parental care. You can calm the noise down by deepening your grasp of what it means to be a child of God. And what it means that the Creator of the universe, He who sustains all things by the word of His power, is your Daddy. That takes time, it takes experiences, it takes suffering at times and learning about your father's love, you know. I think for many, the anxiety they feel at this time about all these issues, the desire to have answers is not always rooted so much in pride, but in a genuine desire to, you know, to defend God, to, to, to be seen as having an answer. But let me tell you something. Your faithfulness, and I say this to pastors and to myself, your faithfulness to God and my faithfulness to God is not measured by the speed by which you answer every issue that comes up on media, social media, every issue that is thrown at you. Your faithfulness to God is not measured by how fast you get on Twitter or Facebook to give a biblical and solid response to every critical problem, be it real or be it fabricated, be it truth or be it political spin, be it raised by society or friends on social media. Your faithfulness to God is not measured by that. And I don't even think Social media is really the right form for where problems are really solved. They're aired, but I don't think they're solved there. Your faithfulness is measured by how you trust God to deal with the big matters that are His and fulfill the things He's given you to do. Your vocations, your callings. You know, moms, we have new babies that are being born. Your calling, your faithfulness is to love your children, train your children, dads with them, feed them, take care of them. What will they become? What will they believe? That's God's. Ultimately. Only He knows, only He's responsible. And it's much the same way with the matters which we face right now. Well then, one last verse, very briefly. Verse 3 ends, O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Now he directs himself to the reader directly, and he says, hope forevermore. What's he mean? Exactly that. Don't give up hoping. Because hope doesn't become sight, doesn't become reality. Till when? Till the very end. When our Lord returns and we see all the big matters resolved by Christ, the true King who wears the true crown forever, for eternity, when we meet God. You know. So what do I do with all this noise? The three points from each of those verses there. Know your place and be content with it. Know God as your Heavenly Father and rest in it. Hope in God's kingdom promises to the very end. God's peace be with you again. I love you. Hope to see you all soon.